Thanks, Brian, for doing a wonderful job in picking those songs. If you have your Bible with you, will you take it out again, please? And go back to your New Testament, and I want to ask you to go back to 2 Peter chapter 1. Will you go there in your Bible with me this morning, back to 2 Peter chapter 1? We're going to read some verses there, or reread some of the verses there that Brother Caleb read for us in, in a few minutes. He led me to certain places and people in my life. He led me to moving to a particular city in a particular state. He led me to my spouse. He led me to my job. He led me to finding the perfect house in a rising housing market. He led me to finding the perfect parking spot near the front at Walmart. He gets into my body at times. He causes me to pass out. He gives me the ability to speak in tongues and perform all kinds of miracles. He even spoke to me in my bathroom one time and told me that my spouse was, was cheating on me. That's the kind of stuff that I've heard people say about the work of the Holy Spirit. That's the kind of stuff I've heard people say about what the Holy Spirit has done and is doing for them in their lives. You see, unfortunately, for so many religious people, they attribute any and, and everything to the work of the Holy Spirit. They say that the Holy Spirit is involved directly in nearly every aspect of their lives. In fact, there are preachers, popular preachers, who throughout the last several decades have literally made a fortune making misleading claims about the work of the Holy Spirit. Men like Oral Roberts and Benny Hinn and T.D. Jakes and Robert Tilton and Peter Popoff and so many others have all convinced people that the Holy Spirit is in the business of working miracles in people's lives today. He's in the business of getting people rich today. He's in the business of getting people out of debt. He will lead people to find the perfect spouse and the perfect house and the perfect, perfect job. Sadly, so many people believe these things. Sadly, because of false teachers for so many people, they believe myths about the work of the Holy Spirit. They believe lies about his work. They believe that he is doing things for people that, that the Bible does not teach. Sadly, so many people, they're just confused, so confused about the work of the Holy Spirit. The question, though, is, is what is the truth? What does the Bible actually say about this? What does the Holy Spirit himself say about his work in the scriptures? Well, if you don't mind this morning in this study, in this second study this morning, I want to talk with you about that, okay? Now that we've had a lesson about the identity of the Holy Spirit, Spirit earlier today, if you don't mind in this lesson, I want to use a few minutes to talk with you about, about the work. I want to talk with you about the work of the Holy Spirit. I want to talk with you about some of the things that the Holy Spirit has done in the past and some of the things that he's doing today. And let's just begin by first talking about the things he's done in the past. What kind of work has the Holy Spirit done in times past? Well, the first work I want to highlight concerning the work of the Holy Spirit in the past is the work of revelation. I want to talk with you a little bit about the Holy Spirit's work of revelation. That is the very work that the Apostle Peter is talking about right here in 2 Peter chapter 1. Are you in 2 Peter 1? Look with me at verse number 20. In 2 Peter 1 and verse 20, Peter says, But know this first of all, that no prophecy of Scripture is a matter of one's own interpretation. For no prophecy was ever made by an act of human will, but men moved by the Holy Spirit spoke from God. Notice how there in those verses, the Apostle Peter is talking about the Scriptures. He's talking about the source of the Scriptures, particularly in this context. He's talking about the source of the Old Testament Scriptures. 
He is saying that when it came to the men who penned the words of the Old Testament scriptures, they didn't write things that were based on their own interpretation. They didn't write down things from their own thoughts or their own opinions or their own feelings. They didn't put their own spin on the 39 books that make up our Old Testament. Instead, these men were moved by the Holy Spirit. They were inspired by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the one who gave them the information that we have in our Old Testament today. Here in 2 Peter 1, Peter is telling us that the source of the Old Testament scriptures is the Holy Spirit, not the mind of men. But not only does the, whole, does the Old Testament come from the Holy Spirit, so does the New Testament. And Jesus makes that point clear back in John 16. I told you we were going back to John 16 today. Go back to John 16 again, please. And look at John 16. We're going back to verse number 12. Here, not long before Jesus not long before he would be betrayed and arrested and crucified for the sins of the world. Jesus said this, these things to his apostles. He wanted his apostles to be comforted with these words. In John 16 and verse 12, he says, I have many more things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. But when he, when he, the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all all the truth. He will not speak on his own initiative, but whatever he hears, he will speak and he will disclose to you what is to come. He will glorify me, for he will take of mine and will disclose it to you. All things that the Father has are mine. Therefore, I said he takes of mine and will disclose it to you. Notice how in addition, in addition to telling us that the Holy Spirit is a person, here in these verses in John chapter 16, Jesus also talks about the Holy Spirit's work. He also talks about the Holy Spirit's work of revelation. He tells the apostles here that once he left them, he was going to send them somebody. He was going to send them the Holy Spirit. He was going to send them the spirit of truth. And the spirit of truth was not just going to reveal to them some of the truth. Instead, he was going to reveal all the truth. He was going to guide them into all the truth. He was going to speak whatever he hears. He was going to take of Christ and disclose it to them. Here Jesus says that the Holy Spirit was going to reveal to the apostles the complete and perfect will of God. And when we continue reading and studying our New Testament, we see that what Jesus promised, that is exactly what took place in Ephesians chapter 3. In Ephesians chapter 3, beginning with verse number 3, the Apostle Paul told the church at Ephesus that by revelation, there's our word, revelation, there was made known to me the mystery. Now, the mystery there that Paul is referring to contextually is the mystery of how Jews and Gentiles were going to become one in, in, in the body of Christ. How was God going to make Jews and Gentiles one spiritual family? How was he going to accomplish that? That was the great mystery of the Old Testament. And Paul says that by revelation, there was made known to me the mystery, as I wrote before in brief. By referring to this, when you read, you can understand my insight into the mystery of Christ, which in other generations was not made known to the sons of men as it has now been revealed. There's our word. It has been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets in the spirit or by the spirit. Now you put that with what Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 2. I hope you got your Bible ready to go because we got a lot of Bible in this lesson. So go to 1 Corinthians chapter 2. In 1 Corinthians chapter 2, we look at verse number 10. And Paul says to the church in Corinth in 1 Corinthians 2 and verse 10, for to us, the us there is a reference to the apostles and the prophets in the first century. Paul says, for to us, God revealed them through the spirit. For the spirit searches all things, even the depths of God. For who among men knows the thoughts of a man except the spirit of a man which is in him? Even so, the thoughts of God no one knows except the spirit of God. 
Now we've received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, so that we may know the things freely given to us by God, which things we also speak, not in words taught by human wisdom, but in those taught by the spirit, combining spiritual thoughts and spiritual words. What's Paul talking about there? Well, he's talking about the origin of his message. He's talking about the origin of his preaching. He's talking about the origin of his writings. He is telling us that everything we have in our hands this morning, it was revealed by the Holy Spirit. It was revealed from the Spirit and by the Spirit. It was taught to the apostles, not with human wisdom, but by the Spirit combining spiritual thoughts with spiritual words. Or Paul is, he's talking about the work of the Spirit. He's telling us that the Holy Spirit is a revelator. He, he is a revealer. He revealed the perfect and complete will of God to the New Testament apostles and prophets, and they in turn wrote those things down so that we can have the Bible that's in front of us today. That's how this process worked, brothers and sisters. And let me just say that practically that means, practically that means that everything we know about God and everything we know about Jesus and everything we know about the creation and everything we know about faith and great Bible characters like Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and Noah and Moses and Sarah and Nehemiah and Daniel and everything we know about the church and everything we know about how to be added to the church by being baptized for the remission of our sins, all that stuff. It comes from the Holy Spirit. It has been revealed in the Bible, by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is responsible for every bit of information that's found in this book. He has done, and he's done well, the work of revelation. But not only has he done the work of revelation, a second work he's done is the work of confirmation. Revelation and confirmation. Now, before we read that verse... On the slide there, I want you to go in your Bible to Mark chapter 16. Mark 16 and verse 20. In Mark 16 and verse 20, after Jesus told his people to go and preach the gospel to every creature. In Mark 16 and verse 20, the Bible says, And they, the disciples, went out and preached everywhere while the Lord worked with them and confirmed, there is our word, and confirmed the word by the signs that followed. So the disciples went out preaching the word of God, and it was confirmed that they were messengers of God by them performing miraculous signs. The Hebrew writer speaks of this more in Hebrews chapter 2. Go on your Bible, please, to Hebrews chapter 2. In Hebrews chapter 2, beginning with verse number 1, the Hebrew writer says this, For this reason, Hebrews 2 verse 1, we must pay much closer attention to what we've heard so that we do not drift away from it. God doesn't want us to drift away from his word. He doesn't want us to fall away from his word. Verse 2, for if the word spoken through angels proved unalterable and every transgression and disobedience received a just penalty, how will we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? After it was first spoken through the Lord, it was, here's our word, confirmed to us by those who heard God also testifying with them, both by signs and wonders and by various miracles and by gifts of the Holy Spirit according to his own will. Question, why should we, why should we take the gospel seriously? Why should we believe the gospel? Why should we have faith in the gospel? Why should we have faith in men like Peter and James and John and Paul and Matthew were actually inspired when they penned the words of the scriptures? I mean, does God just want us to take their word for that? Does God just want us to have blind faith that these men were inspired by him? Of course not. Of course not. Of course God doesn't want us to have blind faith when it comes to the inspiration of the scriptures. In fact, according to the Hebrew writer, in addition to revealing the inspired word of God to the New Testament writers, the Holy Spirit also enabled them to confirm that their message came from God. 
He also empowered them to perform miracles, to confirm that they were actually speaking the very word of God. The Apostle Paul emphasizes that right here in 1 Corinthians 2 and verse 4. He emphasizes that when he tells those in Corinth that when, he, when it came to his preaching, his preaching was not done with persuasive words of human wisdom, but instead it was done in demonstration of the spirit and of power. And demonstration of the spirit and of power. When Paul says in demonstration of the spirit and of power there, he means that not only did the Holy Spirit guide him and direct him in the words that he preached and in the words that he wrote down, but he also confirmed that message by enabling him to perform miracles among the Corinthians. That's the power that Paul is talking about there. He's talking about miraculous power. The Holy Spirit revealed the will of God to Paul, and he gave him the ability to confirm it with miraculous power. The Holy Spirit has done the work of revelation, and he's done the work of confirmation. And let me just say that when it comes to both of those works, brothers and sisters, both of those works are finished works. Those are finished and completed works. Will you go back in your Bible again, please? One more time at John 16. Go back to John 16, please, and look at verse number 13. I want you to look at that verse very carefully in John 16 and verse 13. Notice how as Jesus speaks to the apostles, as he speaks to the men who would go on to pen the words of the New Testament, he does not say to them that the Holy Spirit was going to reveal part of the truth to them and then additional pieces to later generations. He does not say that a little revelation was going to be given to them and then a little bit to us, and then a little bit to other disciples down the line. No, sir, and no, ma'am. Jesus told these apostles that the Holy Spirit was going to guide them into all the truth. He was, going, he was going to reveal to them all the truth. He was going to speak to them all the truth. When Jesus says all there in that verse, he means it. He means all. He means every bit of it. Every ounce of it, every part of it, he means that no, no new revelation is being given today. The rest of the New Testament backs up Jesus when it comes to this. For example, in Jude 3, Jude 3, Jude says, by inspiration of the Spirit, that we as Christians should contend earnestly for, we should fight earnestly for the faith. The faith there is a reference to the system or the source of our faith, which is the gospel. We should contend earnestly for the faith which has once and for all been revealed to the saints. This is a completed work, the work of revelation. Peter makes the same point in 2 Peter 1 and verse 3 when he tells us that God has given us everything. He's given us all the information we need pertaining to life and godliness. And then Paul really backs up the words of Jesus in 1 Corinthians 13, verses 8 through 10, when Paul makes it very clear that when it comes to God's perfect and complete revelation, when all of that was fully assembled, when all of God's will was completely put together, then the miraculous signs that confirmed it, they would cease. They would end, they would be done away with, they would no longer be needed. Throughout the New Testament, we learn that the Holy Spirit's work of revelation and his work of confirmation are finished works. They are completed works. They are works that are not being done today. These truths that we learn about the Holy Spirit's work of the past they mean a couple of practical things for us. First, they mean that anybody who, who comes along today and claims to have new and additional revelations from God, he's a fraud. He's a liar. He's a phony. He is clearly claiming to do something that Jesus says he won't be able to do according to John 16 and verse 13. You see, false teachers, they can't be receiving additional revelation from the Holy Spirit if Jesus said that all the truth was going to be given to the apostles. 
And so the finished work of the Holy Spirit concerning revelation, it confirms the fact that there are false prophets in the world today. Nobody's getting additional revelation from God. But then a second thing this information does for us is it gives us confidence in the Bible. It gives us confidence that we can trust every part of the Bible. You see, unlike the Quran. And unlike the Book of Mormon and unlike the books that make up the Apocrypha, we can know with absolute certainty that the word of God actually is all of God's inspired truth, that the Bible is God's word because those who wrote it, they did miracles. They did supernatural things. They didn't just pen the words and preach the words, but they also confirmed the word by working miracles in front of many eyewitnesses. Holy Spirit's work of revelation and his work of confirmation are finished works. They are works that has been done by the Spirit and they've been done very well by the Spirit. But now that we've talked about what the Holy Spirit has done in the past, let's transition now and talk about what he's doing right now. That's what we really want to know. What is the Holy Spirit doing today? Is the Holy Spirit doing anything today? Is he doing anything in the lives of believers today or is he just retired? Is he sitting up in heaven relaxing and chilling and just kicking back and doing nothing? What is the Holy Spirit doing today? Is he doing anything for us today? Well, as we begin trying to answer this question, let me just begin by pointing this out. Let me point out to you that contrary to what some may believe, the Holy Spirit is working today. He's not retired. He's working today. In fact, the primary tool through which he is working in the lives of people today is through this book right here. It is through the word. It is through the inspired word that he has given us and that is before us this morning. And I know that doesn't sound that impressive to you. I know that. I know that sounds boring and lame and not really that exciting to you, but it's what the Bible teaches. It's what the Bible says. The Bible says that the primary way in which the Holy Spirit works in the lives of people today is through the revealed word he has given. You see, through the inspired word he has given, the Holy Spirit convicts us. He's still in the business of convicting people. He convicts us in our hearts. He convicts us in our souls. He convicts us in our minds. In Hebrews chapter 4 and verse number 12, look at Hebrews 4 and verse 12. There when describing the word of God that has been revealed by the Holy Spirit, the scripture says, for the word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword. And piercing, notice that word, as far as the division of soul and spirit of both joints and marrow and able to judge the thoughts and the intentions of the heart. There we see that the word of God that has been revealed by the Holy Spirit, it is powerful. It is sharp. It is able to cut us right to our souls. Jesus in John chapter 16. Look at John 16 in verse 7. In John chapter 16 and verse 7, Jesus speaks about this work that is being done by the Holy Spirit. When he says in John 16 and verse 7 that he, the Holy Spirit, was going to convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. Jesus said that the Holy Spirit was going to be involved in the, in the work of conviction. He was going to convict people of sin and wicked behavior. We see that in a very practical way being done in Acts chapter 2. Well, you go in your Bible to Acts chapter 2. And Acts 2, you remember this famous sermon. I'm pretty sure you're aware of this sermon. This great sermon that Peter preached on Pentecost about Jesus. He told these thousands of Jews gathered in Jerusalem that Jesus was the Lord and the Christ, and they were guilty of killing him. And in verse number 37 of that chapter, it says in Acts 2, verse 37, when they heard this, when they heard the preaching of Peter, they were pierced. Some of your translations say they were pricked to the heart and they said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, brethren, what shall we do? The implication of that is what shall we do to be to be saved? Oh, it's how after hearing the gospel preached, after hearing the truth that they had 
been guilty of killing the very son of God, the scripture says that they were pricked. They were pierced. The idea of them being pierced is the idea of they were convicted. They were convicted of their sins. They were convicted of their sins by the Holy Spirit. They were convicted by the inspired gospel that had been revealed by the Holy Spirit that the apostle Peter was preaching on this occasion. The Holy Spirit convicted these people of their sins through the word. And my brothers and sisters, let me suggest to you that he continues. He continues to do that same thing today. Even today, and even as I stand before you this morning, the Holy Spirit continues to convict people of their sins. He continues to convict people of the sin of fornication and homosexuality and adultery and lying and stealing and bitterness and unforgiveness and greed and disobeying parents and anything else that is out of bounds and out of step with the will of God. You see, whenever we hear anything from this book, whenever we hear or study or see anything in this book that cuts us deep, that makes us feel guilty and ashamed and afraid because we know our sins are being exposed and condemned by the Bible, you know what that means is going on? That means the Holy Spirit is going to work on us. He's going to work on us through the word. Through the word, the Holy Spirit is convicting our hearts and he's exposing our sins and he's urging us to get our lives right with God. The Holy Spirit, through the word, is still involved in the work of conviction. But not only is he involved in the work of conviction, he's also involved today in the work of conversion. Conviction and conversion. Will you look in your Bible, John chapter 3, please? Look at John 3 and verse 5. John 3, verse 5. Remember in John 3, Jesus has a very interesting conversation with Nicodemus, a conversation about being born again. Remember that? Jesus told Nicodemus that unless a man is born again, he can't even see the kingdom of God. Jesus says that for one to be born again properly, that they must be born again of two things, right? What are they? They must be born again of the water and the spirit. You got to be born again of the water and the spirit. Now, I'm pretty sure that for the vast majority of folks in this room right now, you know exactly what Jesus means when he talks about being born again of water, don't you? You know that when Jesus talks about being born again of water, that is a clear reference to water baptism for the remission of sins. That is a step in the process of salvation that is found all throughout the New Testament. It is found at the end of the Gospel of Matthew and the Gospel of Mark. It's found in the book of Acts, all throughout Acts. It's found in Romans, Titus, Hebrews, 1 Corinthians. It's all over the place. I mean, if Jesus is not talking about water baptism for remission of sins there, then I don't have a clue what he is talking about. Clearly, when he talks about being born again of the water, he's making a reference to being baptized in water for the forgiveness of sins. But what about the next part of that verse? What about the spirit part of that verse? What does it mean for one to be born again of the spirit? I mean, I think it's important that we talk about that as well, because Jesus says that unless we do both, unless we're born again of water and the spirit, we can't see the kingdom of God. We got to talk about that. We can't just emphasize the water part. We got to talk about the spirit part. We got to know exactly what that means. And so let's go in our Bible to first Peter chapter one. Let's go to 1 Peter chapter 1, and let's see what that means, because we can't go to heaven unless we do that. In 1 Peter chapter 1, in verse number 23, Peter says to the people of God, 1 Peter 1, 23, for you've been born again. There's our language. Okay, now we're in the right context. You've been born again, if you're a Christian, not of seed, which is perishable, but imperishable, that is, through the living and enduring word of God. For all flesh is like grass, and all is glory like the flower of grass. The grass withers and the flower falls off, but the word of God or the word of the Lord endures forever. And this is the word 
This is the word that was preached to you. Notice how there Peter tells us exactly what it means to be born again of the spirit. He tells us that if we're going to be born again of the spirit, then we got to be converted by the spirit. We got to be converted by the re revealed teachings of the spirit. We got to be converted by the word of God, the scriptures that have been given to us by the Holy Spirit. That's what Peter is talking about. You see, when we allow the words of the spirit or the words of the gospel to come into our hearts and change us and mold us and turn us away from sin and even lead us to the waters of baptism, you know what we are allowing to take place? We are allowing the Holy Spirit to go to work on us. We are allowing the Holy Spirit to convert us. We are allowing the Holy Spirit to use the word he has given to purify and save our souls. The Holy Spirit convicts through the word. And he converts through the word. And then thirdly, he also sanctifies. He sanctifies through the word. A little short verse, but it's powerful. Jesus in John 17, we went to John 17 earlier today, but look again at what Jesus says in John 17 and verse 17. In John 17 and verse 17, Jesus, as he prays for us, future believers today, he says, sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. Notice how Jesus desires for believers, his people, me and you, to be sanctified. He wants our sanctification. He wants us to be sanctified by the truth. He wants us to be sanctified by the word of God, which is the truth that has been revealed by the Holy Spirit. You see, to be sanctified by the truth means that through the inspired word of God, we've been made holy and set apart for God's purposes. It means that we've been cleaned up spiritually. It means that we've been set apart and made different from the world. It means that unlike the people in the world who wallow in sin and degradation, we have been cleaned up by the blood of Jesus and we've been made priests and children of God. The Holy Spirit sanctifies through the word. In fact, let's add to that by saying that through the word, the Holy Spirit leads. The Bible also refers to this as influencing us. He guides us. He abides in us. He produces fruit in us. The Holy Spirit guides, leads, directs, abides in, produces fruit in us, not through our feelings, not through our emotions, not through nudges, not through miraculous miraculously laying things in our hearts. No, the Holy Spirit doesn't do that kind of stuff. He's never done that kind of stuff in the Old Testament or in the New Testament. He's never guided people and led them in those kinds of crazy ways. Instead, look at what Paul says in Galatians. Galatians chapter 5. I'm going to Galatians chapter 5, and I want to highlight some language here from the apostle. In Galatians 5 and verse 16, Paul's speaking to Christians, me and you, those of us who've been baptized for the remission of our sins. Galatians 5, 16. But I say, walk by the Spirit. Walk by the Spirit. And you will not carry out the desire of the flesh. Verse 18. Be led by the Spirit. Verse 22. The fruit of the Spirit. If you have produce from the Spirit in your life, then you're going to have this stuff. It's going to be manifested before other people. Love. Real love, joy, happiness. You're going to be a person of joy and happiness, not sad all the time. You're going to have peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. That's the kind of stuff that comes from the Spirit. And then in verse 25, you live by the Spirit. If you live by the Spirit, you're going to walk by the Spirit. How do I do that stuff? How do I do that? How do I walk by the Spirit? How, do, how am I led by the Spirit? How do I live by the Spirit? How do I have the produce from the Spirit? Well, my friends, we do all that stuff, simply put, by getting into the Spirit's Word. By studying 
the Spirit's word and allowing the Spirit's word to influence every decision in our lives. You see, when you read the Spirit's word and you study it and you apply what you find in this book to your life, you know what you're doing then? You're walking by the Spirit. You're being led by the Spirit. You're living by the Spirit. You are allowing the Spirit to abide in you. He abides in you through this word. Paul, I think, makes this point clear to us in a familiar text, 2 Timothy 3. You know that text, 16 and 17. Remember, Paul says all scripture is given by inspiration of God. And what is it profitable for? What's profitable for? For teaching and for reproof and correction and training in righteousness so that the man of God may be adequate, perfect, thoroughly equipped for every good work. If you truly want to be everything God wants you to be. If you truly want to be a man of God or a woman of God, if you truly want to make sure you're going in the right spiritual direction in your life, then Paul says you can't be led by your feelings. You can't be led by your emotions. You can't be led by what you think are nudges in your heart. Instead, you got to be led by the spirit. You got to be led by by the scriptures that have been revealed by the spirit. The Holy Spirit is convicting. And he's converting and he's sanctifying and he's leading. But I got to put one more thing up here before we close. Also got to tell you that he's interceding. Oh, yes, he's interceding. And someone says, oh, wait a minute, Sean, I thought we only have one intercessor, and that's Jesus. No, my friend, Jesus is our only mediator. There's only one mediator between God and man, and that's Jesus. But there are many intercessors, and the Holy Spirit is one of them. So go in your Bible to Romans chapter 8, please. Romans chapter 8. And listen to what Paul says in Romans chapter 8 and verse number 26. Paul says, in the same way, the Spirit also... Helps in our weaknesses, for we do not know how to pray as we should. But the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And he who searches the hearts knows the mind of the Spirit, knows what the mind of the Spirit is, because he, the Spirit, intercedes, there's the word, for the saints according to his will. Notice how there Paul talks about something we talked about last Sunday. He talks about prayer, doesn't he? He talks about prayer. He says that sometimes when we're weak and we're hurting and we're struggling to know what to say when we pray because we got some bad stuff going on in our lives, the Holy Spirit steps in and he helps us. He helps us in our prayers. He searches our hearts and our minds and our deepest longings, and he makes our prayers acceptable to God the Father. And someone says, well, Sean, how exactly does the Holy Spirit do that? How exactly does he make our prayers acceptable to God the Father? Well, my friend, I don't know. I am not a prophet, nor am I the son of a prophet. I only have the same information that you do. I don't know exactly how the Holy Spirit does this. All I know for certain, based on Paul, is whatever this particular work is that the Holy Spirit does, this is not something he's doing through the word. This is not something that he's putting upon us or in us or through us. Instead, Paul says, this is something he's doing for us. He's doing this for the people of God. The Holy Spirit is helping us when we're weak and we're feeble and we're struggling to know what to say when we pray. And I'm just going to be honest with you. I don't need to know exactly how he does that to believe what the Bible says and to trust it and have faith in it and allow it to encourage me when I'm going through rough days in my life. I just believe it. Now. There's a lot more we could say about this subject. I'm pretty sure some folks are going to come up and say, well, Sean, what about this? What about that? And you should have talked about that. I know there's a lot more we could say about this, but don't you want to go home at some point? <laughs> we can't be here all day. All I want you to see is the Holy Spirit has. And he does play a critical role in our lives. He plays a critical role in our salvation. He plays a critical role in us knowing the will of God. Through this book, the inspired word, the Holy Spirit works in some powerful ways in our hearts. 
In fact, maybe this morning he's been working in a powerful way in your heart. Maybe this morning he's been pricking and piercing your heart. Maybe this morning he has been through the word trying to urge you in your heart to submit to the gospel and become a follower of Jesus Christ. If that describes you this morning, then we want to help you. We want to take your confession that you believe, you have faith in what the Holy Spirit says about Jesus, that he's the son of God, and that you're ready to repent of your sins, and that you're ready to obey what the Holy Spirit has revealed about the need to be baptized for the remission of your sins. If there's anyone here this morning who needs to respond to the Holy Spirit's message, you come to the front right now. We'll help you. Let's stand. Let's sing.